Hello, my friends, and welcome to Deeply Rooted. I'm your host, Robin Norgren, and we are going together on a journey to discover what it means to be a spiritual being, having human experiences, and then to take it a step further and to live those human experiences more fully, more gracefully, and with more joy. Thanks for joining me. Today's thought, I am on a quest for more wonder. I am on a quest for more wonder. You are on a quest for more wonder. We are on a quest for more wonder. Maya Angelou says, Life is pure adventure. And the sooner we realize that, the quicker we will be able to treat life as art. Think about the times in your life when you felt pure joy. Maybe even when you woke up in the morning. It was right there, greeting you. Joy. Did you notice if it changed your outlook for the day? Did it change what you wore? that day? Did you sing more? What was your outlook on your circumstances for that day? Do you see your life as a piece of art? What parts of your life could you fill with more color? What parts of your life can you live more fully? So um, this ad is sponsored by Anchor. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Here's today's suggestion from the book, The Art of Noticing by Rob Walker. 131 Ways to Spark Creativity, Find Inspiration, and Discover Joy in the Everyday. Play Burn, Buy, or Steal. Many people, Nick Gray points out, just aren't comfortable in museums. So his company, Museum Hack, offers tours specifically designed to combat that unease partly by demystifying hushed and revered spaces. The strategy, he says, is to get people to fall in love with museums, to get more people to go to more museums more often. Partly this means getting highly informed and energetic guides giving, frankly, opinionated tours. Partly it means cluing participants into basics such as what an ascension number means or how to do their own research. Their own research. Sometimes it means getting museum goers to approach a collection in a manner different from whatever the curators had in mind, like seeking out the piece with the highest acquisition cost. And it almost always means using on-the-fly games and challenges to prod participants into interacting with the art and one another in an honest and unpretentious way. One clever example involves the game Buy, Burn, or Steal. 
Participants are challenged to examine all the works in a particular gallery and decide which one they'd be willing to buy, which one they are so, which one they so despise that they'd like to burn it, and which one they love so much they want to steal it. The best thing about buy, burn, or steal is you can play it anywhere, alone, and with others. Can you imagine how you can adapt this kind of game into your own life? Think about restaurants or movies or even books. Things where you just have these, uh, you know, I don't mind, I don't care. What do you want? I don't care. What do you want? All of those little mundane decisions that we make and somehow to turn them into a game. If you're a teacher, can you imagine doing something like this in a classroom? I hope that you try something like this and I'd love to hear what you decided to do. We are discussing the eight myths surrounding drawing. And it's based on, based on a conversation from a book called Drawing with Children, A Creative Method for Adult Beginners Too is the subtitle. And it's by Mona Brooks. So here is myth number three. Mm, I mean myth number four. <laughs> numbers one two and three have been discussed on prior podcasts so make sure and check them out it has been noted in the podcast notes here is number four art lessons should be given only to children who show talent and may become artists when they grow up here is miss brooks thoughts now that i know that all children can draw if given proper exposure i find this statement ridiculous and confusing. Uh, I would definitely agree as an art teacher. I regret that it, in, it intimates that you need to grow up to be an artist and only adds to confusion. Who says you have to be a certain age to be an artist? Unfortunately, children's artwork is looked down on. Its intrinsic work is not recognized, nor is it displayed or hung with due respect. Children could be enjoying their own artwork in the books they read, the items they use, and on the walls of their homes. Myth number five. Structured drawing lessons are inappropriate for children. They should develop their ability through free expression and exploration only. We don't expect children to play the piano, study dance, or learn a sport without showing them the basic components of these subjects. Why do we expect them to understand the complexities of drawing on their own? Imagine expecting children to write creative stories without teaching them the alphabet and the structure of language. Learning the language of drawing and painting is likewise essential for anyone wanting to pursue those arts creatively. Adults who think they can't draw are taught by methods that include demonstration, visual exercise techniques such as mirror imaging, copying other line drawings upside down, and drawing the edges of negative space. Children need to learn the drawing process also, but with similar exercises that are geared to their age level. Children's creativity is not stifled if they're provided with a very general structure and are allowed to interpret the information any way they wish. So my thoughts on this. What's so amazing about uh, the internet, so many things, but you also come across other um, arts, art teachers, art techniques, art tools, and one of them that I have used quite frequently is a um, website called Art Projects for Kids. Now, um, I've actually been following, following this uh, website for close to 12 years now. And so initially, and I believe she's still an art teacher, um, 
Kanthi Bronze Bro, I think her name is. Anyway, so when she originally started her website, uh, Projects for Kids, it really was more about projects and uh, the projects that she did in uh, an art, um, art class setting in, a, in an elementary school. But over the years, she's really found her niche in uh, creating these how to draw templates of like really fun things that kids love to draw, but also um, the basics, you know, like um, landscaping, landscapes and houses and architecture and uh, themed work. And oh man, it's it's been an incredible resource for me in the classroom. And it has also built up my skill as an adult, um, uh, we don't want to call it, uh, an adult artist or, or uh, an, or an adult that draws. Um, because for me, because I have um, gotten into drawing so late, um, I find that it's very hard for me to not get intimidated by just drawing what I see. But if I can get some sort of technique down by drawing it two-dimensionally first, I can then feel a bit more comfort when I go and try to dr just go out, you know, with a sketchbook and um, draw something just by sight. And what I'm hoping is that I am capturing that um, sort of courage and giving it to um, hesitant art artists in my classroom as well. So I would invite you to go check out that website if this is something that you really are interested in pursuing. Um, she offers hundreds of free downloads on how to draw things and you will be pleasantly surprised at how easy you can pick up this technique of drawing. Today, we're going to delve a little deeper into um, Introduction to Spiritual Direction through a book um, by Henry Nowen. And today's subject is on what is prayer? Here are his words. As we look to God in the heart, we do so in relation to the word of God through prayer. What is prayer? How to pray? How often to pray? Are questions explored in the next few essays? Leo Tolstoy crafted a parable that gets to the heart of true prayer. And uh, the parable is called Three Monks on an Island. Three Russian monks lived in a, on a faraway island. Nobody ever went there, but one day their bishop decided to make a pastoral visit. When he arrived, he discovered that the monks didn't even know the Lord's Prayer. So he spent all his time and energy teaching them the Our Father, and then left satisfied with his pastoral work. But when his ship had left the island and was back in the open sea, he suddenly noticed the three hermits walking on the water. In fact, they were running after the ship. When they reached it, they cried, Dear Father, we have forgotten the prayer you taught us. The bishop, overwhelmed by what he was seeing and hearing, said, But dear brothers, how then do you pray? They answered, Well, we just say, Dear God, there are three of us, and there are three of you. Have mercy on us. The bishop awestruck by their sanctity and simplicity, said, Go back to your land and be at peace. There is a difference between learning prayers and prayerfulness, as Tolstoy's famous parable illustrates. The prayerfulness of the heart is deeper and ultimately no more important than particular prayers that are said. Prayers are specific expressions of praise and thanksgiving, confession, petition, supplication, and intercession. Examples of particular prayers are the Lord's Prayer and the Jesus Prayer. Prayerfulness, however, is a matter of the heart, mostly unspoken. 
that reveals itself in gentleness, peacefulness, humbleness, compassion, and other fruit of the Spirit. In Tolstoy's story, it is the monks who pray in spirit and in truth, and the bishop who recognizes their sanctity and prayerfulness, despite their ignorance of the Our Father. Daily prayers and spiritually and a spiritually cultivated quality of prayerfulness throughout the day make possible the Apostle Paul's admonition to pray without ceasing. <laughs>